for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2006 Labor Day Teaching and Deliverance Camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is Friday afternoon, September the 1st, 2006. Dr. William Knoll is the speaker of this service teaching on Called to War. Would you all all stand with me in prayer, please? Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord. Lord, we just come before you now, Lord, to open your word. Lord, we just bind up the spirit of stupor, of inattentiveness, Lord, the spirit of death and dumbness, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We bind the spirits of slumber, Lord, in Jesus' name, and we loosen your spirits of wisdom and knowledge, Lord, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, Lord, and will behold you, Lord God, and that which you have for us in the hope of our calling and the power you've endued us with, Lord, that we can go forth this day, Lord, and that this word shall fall on fertile soil, Lord, and bear crop 30, 60, 100 fold. Devil, we serve you notice. You're not going to steal this. This is going to fall on fertile soil by the Word of God. We proclaim it in the name of Jesus. And all God's folks said, Amen. Amen. And today I'm going to give you a somewhat basic teaching, but can y'all see past me now? Okay. Paul, in his writings, kept referring to his exhortations to a young pastor named Timothy to be a soldier, to be a soldier. Is that that first slide? He said, you're called to be a soldier to warfare. Next slide. In 2 Timothy 2.3, this is the New King James Version, you are therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engages in warfare and tangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who lists him as a soldier. And First Timothy says, This I charge you, Timothy, according to prophecies made concerning you, that you might wage a good warfare. And there are four or five others in there, but those are enough. You are called to war. Now, the Marines, you know, the Marines, in the Marines, every man is first a rifleman. Every Marine from the colonel down is required to qualify as a rifleman at regular intervals. He's qualified, he has to qualify on handling his firearm, his rifle, to know how to put it back together, how to unjam it, how to put it back together, how to make it work, because he's first a rifleman, and then he's a typist, or a bookkeeper, or a truck driver. If he's not on a front-line company or cook, he's still a rifleman. You know, there was a group of, I am told, that there was, there was a group of people in Iraq who were driving a convoy, and they got lost and took a wrong turn. And they were ambushed. And a good number of them were killed. And when they went to investigate the kill zone, only one American soldier had fired his weapon. He was the only one who had spent brass around him. The rest of them were just dead. They were lying there with their guns. In some cases, they didn't even have their guns. Their guns were jammed. They wouldn't work. They weren't able to shoot. They didn't know how to handle their weapon. And therefore, the enemy was able to pick them off. And I speak to you today. I'm going to talk to you about your weapons and who you are. First, to know that you are a Marine, that you're a rifleman in God's army. And you're called to warfare. Next slide. Now, if you're not a soldier, you're a prisoner of war. Luke 4.18. Now, this is Luke when Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth after he'd been filled with the Holy Ghost, and he'd come out of the desert from being tempted, being filled in the power of the Spirit. He went into the, into the synagogue at Nazareth, and he took the scroll, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he read from Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
That word captive means prisoner of war. If you are not a soldier in God's army, you are a prisoner of war. That literally in the Greek means prisoner at the point of the sword. Now, in the uh, Roman army, the soldiers was allowed to supplement their pay by taking prisoners of war. And they could do with these prisoners as they saw fit. And most of them took them down to the market and put them on a little dial, and they put a spear over their head. And that meant prisoner taken at the point of the spear, of the sword. They were for sale to the highest bidder. And they were sold. And if it was a, a lady who was getting a little on in years, middle age, they'd come and look to see how well she would work as a housekeeper or a scrubber or a cook or in the garden, how many years of labor she had left, and they would pay for it. Now, she may have been a hairdresser, but they, they're going to make a, a cook out of her. And she had no say. She was a young, pretty girl. Perhaps they would put her in as a prostitute. Or she'd be attractive. They'd, and she, that might be an abomination to her, but a prostitute she became. Or they killed her. And that is where you were before you got saved. You were a prisoner taken at the point of the spear. The devil didn't even know your name. You were just a number to him. But Jesus came and opened the jailhouse door. And he said, come out. I paid the price. I paid your redemption. I paid the ransom. I bought you back. Come out of the jailhouse. And the minute you walked out and you got a personal Savior, you got a personal devil. You got a personal devil. And when you got filled with the Holy Ghost, you see, when you just got saved, you're not much threat to the devil. Because his spirit is not a spirit of this world. It's a, his kingdom is not a kingdom. It's a, it's a kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And you can't damage him except in the spirit. But when you got filled with the Holy Ghost, you suddenly became a threat to him. And he said, get that one. He put a big star by your name. And when you came down here this camp talking about deliverance, man, he drew a circle around you and said, that one. Too late now. You're already here. He's already got a circle around your name. You better sharpen up your, your M1. Be ready, cause they, be ready with your rifle, because they're coming after you. Praise the Lord. And so, you know, you meet a, a lot of people that are, quote, say Christians, unquote, but they doubt, really doubt whether there's a, a devil or not. You don't find anybody really feel what the Holy Ghost has said. They settle that question. Because you done met them evil spirits, and you know they're real. Let's have the next line. Well, if you're in the army, who is your commander? Well, in Exodus 15, when Moses had come out over the... They had brought him out through the Red Sea, he sang a song. He said, The Lord our God is a mighty God. The horse and rider He is thrown into the sea. The Lord our God is a man of war. The Lord is His name. That... Verse means a great deal to me. Once when I was had my Boy Scout troop in Canada, in Canada, and we were on our fifth day, and we were 75 miles into into Canada, and we had five days to get back to camp. That's 15 miles a day, which is a pretty good distance to paddle a canoe and carry it. And the wind was blowing 20, 30 miles an hour, about a five-knot wind, and raising white caps about three feet high on this lake that was a thousand feet deep. It's a glacial lake, about a thousand feet deep, according to the chart. And uh, I was praying. I said, Lord, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to start back today? And he said, go. So I went out and I talked to the guide. I said, we're supposed to go there? He said, you looked at that water right there? I said, yeah. I was praying. God said, go. He said, well, you're the adult. If you say go, we'll go. But you better look again. So I went back and prayed again. And God said, I said, go. So I went out and I said, okay, we going, boys. Poor old Maynard. He just looks so bad. He got in the, his, in the guide canoe in front. And the two canoes were three canoes. And I said, now, boys, I want you to stay close enough that I can reach out and touch you. And we got on the lee side of the island where the wind was blowing. It was, it was quiet. The water was quiet on the lee side away from the wind. And we had to paddle out into the wind, those three foot. And I began to sing. And I sang... A song from Exodus 15. And it says, I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider He has thrown into the sea. 
The Lord my God, my strength, my song, for He has come my victory. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. And you know something? As we paddled out, that patch of calm water we was we were sitting in went with us. And we paddled a mile and a half across that lake. And over there, five feet with three foot white caps. And over here, five feet away with three foot white caps. But around us was a spirit. And my, my boys began to sing too, because they'd heard the song before. And we sang that all the way across that lake. And when we hit the shore and pulled our canoes up, the waves came back. So we went into the next lake, the same thing. And then we hit up series of alpine lakes in which the trees were real high and the wind didn't bother us anymore. Well, that means a whole lot to me. When he says, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. And Psalm 24 said, who is the Lord of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your gates, O you Lord, and lift them up, you everlasting God. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord of the armies. He is the King of glory. So the commander is listed in here in Revelation. And that, that print is so small, I can't even read it from him. Praise God. But that is Jesus Christ leading a victorious army. And He's clothed in a in a garment dipped in blood. And he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And on his thighs written the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he's coming back, folks, and he's leading that army back. And he, they're not going to pull his beard out when he comes back this time. They're not going to spit on him when he comes back this time. He's coming back as a conquering king. And on his head is a diadem. And he's not the diadem of the sport of winning the sports event. It's the diadem of the, of the imperial potentate. And what is an potentate? A potentate means rule maker. He makes the rules. You might not like his rules, but he makes the rules. He is in the high potentate. Lord God Almighty, and He is coming back as our King and as our, as our Bridegroom. We thank You, Lord. You know, all these families get talking, I say, I'm the Bride of Christ, and that don't bother me at all. Praise God. Let's move on. Now, there are two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms. Did you say that in the Bible? Yes, it says that in the Bible. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Well, where does it say it in the Bible? It says it in Matthew 25 to 28. Here Jesus has been casting out demons and the, and the, and the Pharisees say He's cast them out by the spirit of Beelzebub. He says, but Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. But if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. Then how will his kingdom stand? Satan's got a kingdom. Okay? But if you cast out devils by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? And they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Now the next is the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. And here in Acts, Paul speaks in his testimony to King Agrippa. And he's speaking of his testimony, and this was what God seemed to do, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power, that is, that is exorcism, the authority of Satan to God. You know, Satan's got authority. Don't ever think Satan doesn't have authority. He has authority. God gave him authority. Now, he misused it. He rebelled. But remember that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God didn't take it away from him, just like he doesn't take your gifts away from you. That they might receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, the kingdom of light is under Jesus Christ. The same verse. And the kingdom of darkness is under Satan's power and authority. Okay, next slide. Now, look at this. This is 2 Timothy 2, 25-26. And it says, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition or rebellion, that they, perhaps, if God will grant them repentance. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? 
if perhaps God will grant them repentance. You mean to tell me that you can't repent when you want to? Hmm? You can't repent when you want to? It says, if perhaps God will grant them repentance. Godly sorrow. The second Corinthians says, Godly sorrow bringeth repentance. I'm, oh, I'm getting off on another tangent. I better move on. That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having taken captive by him to do his will. And so, you see, Satan has taken them captive to do his will. Next slide. Now, here, let's look at this. Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he's speaking to the Ephesians, and you, he's made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince. Now, I want you to note that word prince, because we're going to come back to that word prince, of the power of the air. And that word power is authority again. That is the area of that prince's, of that authority is the area that he has control of, of the air. Okay, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature or inheritance children of wrath, just as the others. So your nature, your unsaved nature that you inherited from your father Adam is wrath, rebellion. Now, keep your fingers there, and let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. It's not on the slides. Let me show you something. Look in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness and after his image and named him Seth. And so you see, Seth was the father from this line of Seth named Noah, and from Noah came everybody in his room. And so you were, you were made. Now, Adam created in the image of the living God. But you were created in the image of the fallen Adam, and were by nature or inheritance children of wrath or anger or rebellion. You inherited it. Okay. And here it says the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I can give it to whomever I wish. Now, a lot of people say that the devil was lying, and... Uh, but Jesus didn't call him a lie. Jesus just said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to fall down. He said, if you will just fall down and worship me. He said, it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He didn't say you can't do that, that, that you don't have that power or authority. Next. And so you had those areas of Adam. But you were born again. Salvation or rebirth places you in the kingdom of God and the family of God. Now, look at... Uh, it's not a natural birth. Look at John. Next slide. Here you've got John. As many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right authority to become children of God. To those who believe on his name, who were born. Now get this. Not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, or the will of a man, but God. Who were born not of blood, not of natural bloodlines. Or the will of the flesh, two people get together and decide that they want a child. And the next part is better, best translated, according to Derek Pence, the lust of the husband. It says the will of man, but that's better translated, the lust of the husband, but of God. It's a miracle birth, like Isaac. You were born again of a miracle birth. Let's have the next slide. We should have verse 3 here. In verse 3, 3 it says... Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. To which Nicodemus said, How can I get back in my mother's womb and be born again? And then Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which are born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There are two ways to be born. Born of water, what does that mean? When you're born, first there's the breakage of the water, and the amniotic fluid gushes forth, and you're born with the water of the amniotic fluid. That's a natural birth. And the second is you're born again of the Spirit when you're born again. It's a spiritual birth. It's not a natural birth. There's not a blood, nor the will of the 
The will of the flesh or the will of the husband. It is a miracle birth. You are born again into the kingdom of God. You are transferred into the kingdom of the Son of His love. First Colossians. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the saints of the light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Next slide. Our citizenship is in heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven, which we weakly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, a member of the household of God. Philippians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now remember, he has said, it says in Romans 15, 8, 15, he said, He did not give you a bondage, a spirit of bondage again to fear, but he sent the spirit of adoption into your heart whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Galatians says, He has sent the spirit of his Son into your heart crying, Abba, Father. The spirit of his Son. Not the Holy Spirit. The spirit of his Son. You read it in Galatians. Crying out Father. Next slide. Now you're an ambassador. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As through God we're pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is represents government. He is an ambassador. The U.S. ambassador to England is President Bush's personal representative, King of England. The office he sits in, his office and his staff, is considered U.S. territory. The U.S. Marines guard it. There's a Marine contingent armed there to guard it, to keep anybody from taking U.S. property. He has diplomatic immunity, which means he is immune to the laws of that nation. Okay? Now, you are God's ambassador to this country. And you say, well, now you know if the, uh, you remember when they stormed the, the ambassador, the, uh, the consulate in Tehran, Iraq, Iraq, Iran, Tehran, Iran, back in 1979. Jimmy Carter had an aircraft carrier there. He could have sent, when they called him and said, they're coming over the walls. He could have had the Marines open up with machine gun fire to shoot them. And then he could have had the carrier send the fighters to lay down napalm around it to protect it. And sent the Marines in to bring them out. He's afraid he'd offend somebody doing that. God bless him. He wanted to please everybody. Unfortunately, as a leader, you can't please everybody. And if you're going to be a preacher, deliverance minister, you think you're going to please everybody? I tell you, no. And if you're going to say you're going to give a gospel that you think everybody wants to accept and going to sound good and tickle everybody's ears, you are not speaking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're an ambassador. Now, if you're in the ambassador to Iran and you go, you run on over to Iraq and get drunk and run over somebody, and then you call President Bush and you say, uh, uh, if he called President Carter or President Reagan or somebody and said, I'm over here, I'm your ambassador, I'm over here in Iraq, and I run over somebody, send the Marines to get me, he said, Iraq, what you doing there? You're not supposed to be there. So, I'm sorry, boy, you're, you're subject to the laws of that land. We'll send you a lawyer, but you may have to pay the penalty. Now, the one thing about an ambassador, he can call on all the armed forces of that government as long as he is where he's supposed to be in the will of, in the will of that government. He's there doing his job where he's supposed to be. He can call on the Marines to come get him and to back him up. But if he ain't where he's supposed to be, he's out there naked. That's the authority you have as long as you stay in the will of God and not in the flesh. For it says there's now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Y'all ever heard that that, that verse? How many of y'all ever heard the rest of it? You know, there's another part that they leave out. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. For the law of life and the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've got to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. To call on the ambassador of the Most High God, I'm an ambassador of the Most High God, and I can call on all the armed forces of the government to come set me free. You've got to be where you're supposed to be. Norman Parrish. 
Liz lived in Guatemala for the last 50 years. They've been in they've been so much rebellion, so much revolution down there. And Norman tells me that uh, when God tells him to go someplace, he gets in his car and goes. He never worries. He travels across rebel lines. He travels through communist lines. He travels through government lines. He said he's had barrel, gun barrels stuck in his face, and he's had all sorts of things. But he's never been hurt, never been robbed, never been hurt. He's always just passed through. He said, don't you go in there. All those people will kill you. He said, God said, go. I'm not worried. And he goes. And God says... And they let him through. God will not take you to a place that His grace will not sustain you. I remember when I had the privilege of meeting... Oh gosh, I can't, I can't ever remember the man's name. He was a prisoner. He was a Romanian Jew who was saved into the Lutheran Swedish church. And he was a Hitler's prisoner for five years in Romania. And then he was imprisoned by the communists for 20 years. And they let him out. And he told me that his cell was four feet long, four feet high, and two feet wide. And he spent 20 hours a day in it. I made a box that big and tried to get in it. And I didn't have a door on it. You know, they shut the door and had one little hole in it. And we talked about it, you know. And he said that when he finally freed him, as he was on the bus leaving and he looked back at the prison, and he said, Lord, if I can't be as close to you out here as I was in prison, I want to go be back to my cell. I said, Lord, I just got in that box and in 30 minutes my back was killing me. It was the most cramped thing. And I know that if I had been shut up and couldn't see, I'd have gone crazy. And I said, Lord, how can anybody spend 20 hours a day in here? And he just said very sweetly, said, I didn't call you to get in that box. Yes, Lord. He will not take you to a place whose grace will not sustain you. Praise you, Lord. How long are you going to be a soldier in combat? There is no discharge. You know, in World War II, in Korea, you got drafted for two years. In Vietnam, you got drafted for two years. But in World War II, you know how long you got drafted? They said, when are you going to get out? He said, I'm in for the duration. You were drafted for the duration of the battle. You were drafted for the duration. It says there is no release from that war. There's no discharge. Ecclesians, I mean, Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. Okay, let's look at this now. When did the war start? Now, I'm going to give you something I think is, to me, is the best exclamation. I have no desire to be controversial, unduly controversial. And there are people who don't agree with this. Now, if you don't agree with it, please don't get mad at me. I won't get mad at you if you don't agree with it, okay? But Derek Prince believes it. Watchman Nee believes it. Number of other good Bible commentators believe it, and to me it makes it makes the best sense. Let's have the first slide. The story of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim, that's the plural Godhead, Aim, created Bara, singularly created the heavens and the earth. And so there you got the mystery right there. You got the mystery of a plural Godhead singularly created. The heavens and the earth. Okay, next slide. Now, Job says that the angels were present when the earth was created. Here it says, Where were you when I laid the foundation? God is questioning poor old Job in in 38 now. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. For you, Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were foundations fasted? Well, who laid the foundations? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so here we have angelic beings being present and shouting when the earth was created. Next slide. Now, the second verse says, The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That first verse, the earth was without form and void. That's tohu and bohu. You know, they said about me in high school I could torment one poor word ten thousand ways. So don't hold me on the pronunciation. But those are two words. They are used together. Individually, they are used to indicate a wasteland. A howling desert wasteland. Now, Isaiah 48, 5, it's not in your handout, says, let's read that. Isaiah 45, 8, I think it is. I'm sorry. 
You know, it's dangerous when you call out a memory. 4518, is that it? Yes, 4518. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens and the who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established, He did not create it in vain. That's tohu. Same word up there without form. An empty waste. Who formed it to be inhabited. So God didn't create the world of formless waste. Okay. Now that word was there. Next slide. The word translated without form and void when used together in the Bible indicate God's judgment. Next slide. It's used together three times, once in Genesis, once in Isaiah 34:11, speaking of Edom. And if you go back and read the whole thing, it says uh, the land will become a howling waste full of sand pits and tar pits and all kinds of problems and nothing's going to live in it. And the pelican and the porcupine and the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of intimates. That's tohu and bohu, other words. And Edom, to this day, nothing lives in it. It's a formless waste. Let's look at the next one. Jeremiah 4.23. There he says, I beheld the earth, and it was without form and void. Jeremiah is talking about the punishment that's going to come on Israel. And it was without tuhu and bohu. And the heavens had no light. Let's look at the next slide. And the word translated world said the, the world was without form and void. And that word was is translated became elsewhere in the Bible. Now let's look at where it's translated became. Next slide. Here in Genesis two seven, it said the Lord God formed the man of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There the word translated was is translated became. There. Let's look at the next one. And his wife looked back, talking about Lot, his wife. Behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Those are two of many of many. Let's look ahead now. Now, during this time gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God created this beautiful country to be inhabited. And there were angels in it and sons of God. Now, the Bible is the history of the Adamic race. Now, there's some glimpses into the past. But what happened, we don't really know. We don't know when the dinosaurs, the Bible doesn't say. I mean, they go through and they pick out the verse that talks about sea monsters and say that was a dinosaur. They don't know that. We don't know about the dinosaurs. We don't know about this or that or the other. We just know that ten, six or eight or 10,000 years ago, God restored the earth in seven days and created man, Adam. And the history is... But before that, apparently... There was a rebellion. There was a earth, was a beautiful garden. In the earth, there was a beautiful garden of Eden. And on it was a holy mountain. And there was praise and worship that went on. But the rebellion occurred. And this is clearly portrayed in the Bible. And let's look at it. Let's, let's look at uh, Isaiah 14. Now here we say, look at Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That word Lucifer means light bearer. Did you know that matches used to be called Lucifers? I can remember when I was a small kid, if you, uh, if you wanted a cigarette, they wanted to light the cigarette, you said you got a Lucifer. And when you strike it, you get a mat, you get a light. And uh, in David Copperfield, they were called Lucifers. How are you fallen from heaven, O son of the morning? How were you cut down to the ground? You who up weakened the heavens, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mound of the congregation on the further side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And then you read the rest of it, and it says there's... Uh, a prophecy that has not yet come to pass. Let's hear the next one. Now, the next one is in Ezekiel 28. And this is a prophecy to Ty. The first 12 verses is to the king of Ty, who thinks he is a god, but he is a man. And the second portion, from 12 on, says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Ty, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were 
the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, we know that uh, the devil was in the Eden, was in the garden of God, in the garden of Eden, as a snake. But it's not a snake they're talking about here. In the Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering. The sawdust, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold, the workmanship of your firebrands and pipes, that speaks of praise and worship, was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub. That means, now that's singular of cherubim that are around the throne of God. You were the anointed cherub who covered or who reflected His glory. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Do you all know where the fiery stones are? If you don't, read Ezekiel 1 or Ezekiel 10, and you will read about the fiery stones. God has got a lot of fire. Okay. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading. Old King James says merchandising. The root is tail-bearing. It means to sell by talking. You became filled with violence within. You sinned. Therefore I cast you out, you profane thing, from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Next slide. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they might gaze on you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst that devoured you, turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all that saw you. And the last part has not yet come to pass. He still walks around as an angel of light, going back and forth, accusing the saints. But it will come to pass when he's thrown into the fiery pit, the fire prepared for the devil and his angels that's spoken of in, by Jesus in Matthew 25. Now here we have a spiritual being who rebelled, and most commentators believe that he took one-third of the angels with him, based on this scripture. Next. Lucifer became Satan, or the devil, Revelations 19.25, and with a third of the angels under his authority, Revelation 12.3. Next. Revelation 12.9 says, That great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil of Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. Next slide. Another sign appeared in heaven, the great fire red dragon. That's the devil with seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. And his tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And then there are references to the stars being angels also. I don't have them in there. And so here we have the devil. And so this rebellion occurred. Praise you, Lord God. Next slide. Our enemy, kingdom of darkness. Now, Paul differentiates who our enemy is. Now, in a soldier, as a Marine, the first thing they treat you before you go to battle is who you're fighting. They tell you all about him. And he says, we are not, in Ephesians 6, 10, it says, we are, we are not unaware of his wiles. Does anybody know what the word wiles means? Hmm? Well, it comes from the uh, word methodius, which we get the word methods. The devil's got so many methods. See, the devil is a Methodist with a little M. He, you know, he very seldom changes his methods. Why? Because they work so well. They work. You know, and he try one on you and it don't work. And he runs a mouse around and says, you know, this works against Grandpa. Let's try this one. Okay. Let's move on here. Ephesians 6 says they're without physical bodies. And we compare that to... Ephesians 1.21 and Colossians 1.16. Let's look at Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Remember that when you're fighting the devil, you aren't fighting your Christian friend who's being rude and nasty to you and cutting you down. We're not fighting the sales clerk who's rejecting you and being nasty to you and acting like you don't amount to anything. You aren't fighting those people. You're fighting a spirit that you can't see. The devil is using them to try to cut you down, try to get you to take up an offense. 
not to have you respond in the fear, pride, and not in love. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Remember I told you to remember that word prince? The prince of the power of the air? The prince of this world cometh? That's principalities. Same root. It's also, in the New King James, it's also translated as rulers. Against principalities. Against powers. That word power is authority. And you'll generally see principalities and powers together. It is a ruling prince in the area of his authority. And it is structured from a general to a colonel to majors to colonels, lieutenant colonels, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, and buck privates. A huge army that goes out in orderly fashion. A evil prince is assigned a certain area depending on the threat to God's kingdom, I mean to his kingdom, and he's assigned an un, a huge number of underlings to do his bidding. Let's have, let's see, no, let's go back, I'm sorry. Against rulers of the darkness of this age, that word is kamamotos, and those are the earthbound demons. Now some people believe that's another name for Satan, but Satan is a created entity. He can be only in one place at one time. So he's got a huge army assigned to watch you and to bring your, down your kingdom and kill you as slowly and painfully as possible. He wants to kill you. He wants to make, he, he wants to take God's image. You look like God. He got in a fight with God and he lost. And so he, what does he see? He sees you. When he sees you, he sees God. He mad, boy. And he gonna get you. He wants to make you and can't you see him talking to God now? What do you think about you? Ain't see this poor drunk walking down the street, bumping all over him, steps, staggering, falling to gutter. And he says to God, "What do you think of your image now? Look at him down there. Oh, someone who's committing some type of sin, some type of sexual sin, some type of theft, some type of murder, some type of mutilation. I mean, just some kind of horrible sin." He said, "Look at that. What your image is doing." That's what the devil wants to do, and he wants to kill you as slowly. And as, you know, he treats his people badly. I've ministered to lots of Satanists, and I tell you, they've all had cancer, and been in an insane hospital, and all sorts of things. They're miserable people. He treats them horribly, but they're his. He owns them. He hates them too. And so that word rules the dog means come on to us against a spiritual host. That's an army of wickedness. In heavenly places. Now, in the old King James, that heavenly is translated high. And now we have people who are supposed to be good Bible commentators say that means, you know, high places like the President of the United States. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That word is used several other places in the King James and in, in Ephesians. And in every one of them, they translated it heavenly. But when they got to this, they'd all been influenced by Pil Milton's Paradise Lost. And they couldn't believe that the devil could be in the heavens. Because Milton's paradise laws had him in a hole in the ground. That's where filthy lucre comes from. You know, in your King James, he says, not, not greedy after filthy lucre. What does that mean? It's money. Where did that come from? Well, in Milton's paradise laws, when the angels and the devil, bad angels all got together, they said, what are we going to do now? We've been cast out. And one named Luca said, well, let's go in. Let's form a business compound. And we can make a whole lot of money and we can control the earth. And so, money became known as filthy lucre, after Luca, the, the bad angel who wanted a lot of it. That's an aside. I just thought I'd tell you where it came from. But they didn't believe it could be in the heavens, so they put high places. Next slide. Now, here in Ephesians 1, it says, Jesus is far above all principality and power. See the word? Power, authority, might, and dominion. in every name that's named. Next slide. Now, here in Colossians, he gives the order. He said, by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones, dominions, of principalities, of power. See, that's the descending order. You notice that you will not find a verse that said the rebellion broke out on the dominion or the throne level, only on the principality level. And Jesus is above all principalities. Next slide. Now, if you look at principalities, you can compare it with John twelve thirty-one. Okay. Now, the judgment of this world and the ruler, that's the New King James, Old King James, print of this world will be cast down. Same word, principality. Next. I will no longer talk much of this, for the ruler of this world is coming. That's the prince of this world. That's Satan. And he has nothing in me. How many of us can say he has nothing in us? 
Oh, I wish, Lord. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, the favor firstborn of the dead, the prince over all the kings of the earth. See, he is the ruler of all principalities. To him. And so there you have the word principalities. Next slide. Powers means authorities. Next. Kamamotos, the rulers of the darkness of this age. Next. And the evil host of wickedness. A host, that means an army of wickedness in heavenly places. You compare that, and those are the places where heavenly, that same word heavenly, appears. Ephesians 20 there, and worked and raised him from the dead and seated him, seated him in his right hand in heavenly places. Okay. And raised us up together with us and made us to sit in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Next. And to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God shall be made known by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places. Okay. And so you see that word is heavenly, not high. So what are the weapons of our warfare? Now, you know, we know our enemy. Our enemy is a evil host, an evil army intent on destroying you. Now, I could sit and talk. I can show you scriptures that show you that he's assigned. He's got, they are assigned to your family line. They're sitting around waiting. The wonderful thing is, as long as you walk in the Spirit of God, you've got authority over them. That's the wonderful thing. You have authority over them. Weapons of our warfare. Let's look at the first weapon. The first weapon is forgiveness. Now, the definition of forgiveness is to give up resentment against or desire to punish or pardon. This is Webster's College Dictionary, 2nd Edition, 1976. The Webster's Third International Dictionary says... uh, Give up the right to revenge. I like that better, but I didn't have it, so I couldn't copy it exactly. And I feel like I went to the library. Okay, let's uh, to give up all claim to punish, to exact penalty, to cancel or remit. That's already they left out the MIT. Remit a debt. Next slide. And so when you forgive people, you don't want to see them punished for what they did to you. And Jesus said, if we forgive men their trespasses. Well, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. In other words, you're still in your sin if you don't forgive. So your first weapon is to get right with God. So you've got power and authority. In the next slide. Most assuredly, and here's one from Mark, talking about uh, prayer. Most assuredly, I say to you, to this mountain... That whosoever says this mountain be removed and cast in the sea does not doubt in his heart, believes the things that will be done whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you pray, believe that you receive them, you'll have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, that's plain English, folks. Now, I've had folks spiritualize that and say that's not what it really means. You just don't understand how, well, why Mark was written or why Matthew was written. And they'll try to spiritualize around that. But I don't have any trouble understanding plain English. What about y'all? Next slide. And the master was angry. Now, this is about the parable of the unforgiving servant who owed the master $2 billion in gold, 10,000 talents of gold. And the master forgave was going to sell him into slavery. And he begged him and said, forgive, give me time. And so he, he forgave him the debt. Then he went out and grabbed his fellow servant, owed him a hundred days' wages. Three months' wages, about $10,000. And said, uh, pay me. He said, well, give me a little time. He had him cast into jail and he went and told the master. And the master was angry and delivered him to the torturers or the tormentors or the jailhouse, depending on which translation you have. Until he should pay all that was due him. And so my heavenly Father will do to each of you if from his heart he does not forgive his brother his trespass. Let me tell you something. you got unforgiveness in your heart. God has released you to the tormentors. That's what it says. And Brother Glenn, you can go to Brother Glenn, and if you got unforgiveness, if you don't forgive, Brother Glenn can't pray them things off of you. There ain't a preacher in this building that can pray those things off of you if you got unforgiveness in your heart and you won't forgive. Now, what are the tormentors? That's an interesting word in the Greek. It originally applied to people who tested currency. Uh, you know, in, in those days, they didn't have paper money. They had metal money. And so they had these caustic solutions, and they dipped that gold coin down in it and come up, and it didn't dissolve, and it didn't... Oh, that must be gold, because they won't touch that, or silver. 
And so these people that use these caustic solutions to test the coins, that word was transferred to a certain group of people in the jailhouse that tested your testimony to see whether you were telling the truth or not. Now, you remember now when Paul was arrested in Acts uh, 25, and they hauled him into the praetorium, and they said, well, bind him up there and flog him, and let's ask them why they want they after him. In other words, we're going to whip him real good so he'll tell the truth. Now, those are the tormentors. Those, that's what that word got to those people that tested your testimony. And they had all kind of interesting ways to do it, like they'd pull your fingernails out or put your finger in the Iron Maiden and, and tighten the tongue thumb screws and crush your fingers one at a time. Said, so now you're going to tell us? Now you sure that's right. And he twisted a little bit more and crushed all your fingers. And, you know, ordinary folks can't do that. So they employ a special type of sadistic, demon-possessed individual to do that. And that is a description of the demons. They are mean. Man, they want to hurt you. They laugh. They get their jollies when they can cause you pain. Anything they can do to hurt you and cause you pain and suffering, that gives them their jollies. To them, that's fun. Those are the tormentors. And that's that crowd that's waiting out there for you if you won't forgive. Or you get into sin and won't come out. That's the crowd that's out there waiting on you. I'm going to tell you folks, the only folks crazy won't want to have something to do with them people. Praise you, Lord God. So their first weapon is to forgive. Next slide. It says, you know, how do you forgive? He says, love your enemies. You heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons or Daughters of your Father in heaven, for He makes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so you're called to pray and love your enemies. Love is the fulfillment of the law. What did Jesus say? He said, The, the first and great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Paul says love is the fulfillment of the law. You can do anything in love. True, agape love, unconditional love. So the next line. To God, the Lord our God, belong mercy and forgiveness. For we forgive, we rebelled against Him. That's Daniel. You see, forgiveness, revenge belongs to God. It says in Exodus, you want revenge? You want to see somebody pay for what they did to you? You're a thief. You stealing something belongs to God. Revenge don't belong to you, it belongs to God. You want to see somebody pay for what they did to you, you're a thief. And you don't want to come under the curse of the thief, I can show that to you. God has mercy and forgiveness. What do you want? You want justice? You want what you deserve, or you want mercy and grace? What do you want? Lord, give me mercy. Don't give me justice, Lord. I want mercy and grace. Let's have the next slide. Don't judge. Now here read this. King James says Judge not that you be not judged, but what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and by the measure you use, be measured back to you. Change that word judge. The, the marginal reading for that judge is condemn. Condemn not, and that you be not condemned. For with the condemnation you condemn, you will be condemned. And the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And that's the same measure them prosperity folks are talking about when they bring their offering by and they say, you know, give. And by the measure you use, you pour a thimble full in, then God's going to pour a thimble full of blessings out. But you get that big bucket and pour into the offering plate, then God's got that great big tank up there He's just going to dump out on you. Okay? That same measure they're talking about right there. When you condemn somebody... That's the condemnation you go get back. That's God's business. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He knows everything. He knows all the facts. He knows the intent of your heart. What He wants you to do, you see, he, God's nature, as shown in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, He says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, Full of truth and goodness, showing mercy for thousands. Same word as goodness. 
showing mercy for thousands, forgiving of sin and iniquity and transgression. You see, God's nature is to be merciful, and He wants to be merciful. And He wants you to ask Him to be merciful to your enemies. And he says, if you will do that, I will be merciful to you. He set it up so that the measure of mercy you ask for your enemies is the measure of mercy he's going to pour out on you. Do you understand that? If you've got people who've hurt you, who've disappointed you, who have caused you pain, then you pray for God. Pray to God and forgive them and say, God, I don't want to see them pay for this. Don't make them pay, Lord. Be merciful to them like you were merciful to me. Be merciful, Lord. Have mercy on them. Now, what God does with that is God's business. He will look at all the intents and everything. And He might decide that they need to be punished. But that's His business, not yours. And if He sees you sin getting punished, don't you go shout and yell and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that displeases God. When you can really weep, when you see people who've hurt you, when you can really weep, when you see misfortune come upon them, then you know that you have forgiven. That you've forgiven. It doesn't hurt anymore. When it comes up, it doesn't hurt anymore. I don't have to hurt when I see them. How many of y'all got people when you see them, you hurt? It brings back pain and you weep. I don't know about y'all, but I do. And I pray for them and I say, oh, God. Mercy on them. Touch them and bless them, Lord God. And you pray for them. And as that pain goes away and they no longer hurt when you see them, and you see them in pain and you pray and say, Oh, God, have mercy on them. You know that you've forgiven and that you can move on and God is going to be merciful to you by the same measure. Next slide. Now, the battlefield is your mind. After you've forgiven and you pray for your enemies, For those that have hurt you. And one thing I didn't put in there was something that is very important. I've come to realize much more important than I ever realized in my life is the relationship you have with your parents. It says in the the, the commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says, Honor father and your mother that it will go well with you. And that you will live a long time. That's the first commandment of the promise. Now, don't say honor your mother if she's been nice to you. Don't say honor your father if he's if he's fulfilled all his promises, been a good dad, has always been sweet and kind to you, and been good to you and everything. It doesn't say that. It says honor your father, period. And so what do you do? You honor him. You don't speak bad about him. You don't get out and, and uncover their, their dirty linen and tell everybody what a rotten dog they were and how they've left you and how they've done this and how they've done that and how they've done the other. You don't advertise your dirty linen. You think of all the good things you can think about. You know, after all, he did, he did fall for you. And you just pray for him and ask God to bless him. And when you see him, you speak honor to him. And if he castrates you and, and chastises you, you say, what have I ever done? To hurt you. Whatever I've done, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Don't answer back. A soft word turneth away wrath, grievous words stir up anger. Regardless of what they say, you just say, I love you. I am terribly sorry. Please forgive me. What can I do to help you? Honor your parents. Send them a birthday card, a Christmas card, Father's Day card, and never come out of your mouth of words of dishonor. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, a stronghold is a redoubt. That is an area in which a demon will take refuge in you. Casting down arguments. Those are logical arguments. Oh, come on now. You don't really believe in demons, do you? That's just a medieval superstition. You don't really believe in it. You don't think that demons could cause you to be sick. That's just bacteria. Or, you know, you you, you depressed because you've got this chemical imbalance in you. Now, we need to give you this medicine to chemically straighten out your chemicals. What chemicals are they talking about? They don't know. They don't know. But they've got to have something to say. And so they give you all this dope and you're walking around like this, you know, you can't walk. Now, this dope doesn't make you feel better. And if you're not willing to get right with God, you're not willing to get right with your neighbor and cast the demons out, then yeah, it's better to be walking around all doped up so you know that you know that you ain't going to go shoot yourself. And a lot of folks prefer that because it's easier to swallow them pills 
and just to walk around in a chemical haze the rest of their life. It's a horrible life, but they can't see it. They can't see how horrible it is. They can't see the pain and the anguish they cause their loved ones. They can't see the terrible things that, that happen because, you know, they don't know any other life. I have relatives who live on pills. They got a they got a double handful of pills. They take they they take four five hundred dollars worth of medicine a month. Sometimes more than that. I got one woman who takes eight hundred dollars worth of medicine a month. I don't see how she walks, but she has panic attacks if she doesn't. We we'll try to talk to her about getting right. She ain't interested. I'm not sure I'm talking to who or talking to a demon. To tell you the truth. Okay. Pulling down these logical arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's logical arguments, philosophy, medical knowledge. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's have the next slide. Thoughts. Now let's look at this. Here in 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, Lest Satan take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, this is not the same word that we talked about in wiles. We said those were methods. But this is devices, and that word means thought or mind. Next, next slide. Let's check all right through the Bible. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, whose minds, that's the same word as devices, the God of this world has blinded. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of God, who is the uh, glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So there we have that their thoughts, their minds has been blinded. Next. Now here we have the famous verse in Philippians 4.4. 4. It starts, Rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Let your supplications and prayers be made with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That word minds is thoughts. Guard there, in the old King James, is keep. That's uh, If you look at Thayer's, Thayer's lectionary, that word means to surround with, to garrison with troops, or surround with troops so nothing can come in or out. And it's with rejoicing and thanksgiving. That your prayers are made known to God. And then this happens. You know, 1 Thessalonians says, For it is the will of God in all things to give thanks. All things. And the peace of God which patheth all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Whatever things are good, whatever things are noble, whatever things are good report, whichever things are, are virtuous, praiseworthy, think on these things. That's the next verse. Now, I've left out one or two of them, I'm sure, but... You can read it. Those are the things you're supposed to do. Let's see the next slide. Next. Okay. The sources of your thoughts. Now, when a thought comes into your mind, you decide where it come from. Number one, did you decide to think about it? No, that's the first thing from my mind. Well, you think the Holy Spirit brought that? Oh, no, the Holy Spirit wouldn't bring that up. Well, it wasn't you that decided to do it, and the Holy Spirit didn't bring it up. Where did it come from? Well, let's see here. The sin in your body. Well, let's first one, let's look at Genesis. Not up there, but let's go back to Genesis 3. Eh, Genesis 4, I'm sorry. Genesis 4, 8, eh, 7. Genesis 4, 6, and 7. The Lord said to Canaan, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, Sin lies or crouches at the door, and its desire is for you, and you should rule over it. Now, that word sin is an interesting word. It is an occasion root. I don't know occasion, and I called my son over in Cambridge. He was in Cambridge at the time, and I said, Ashley, uh, this occasion word, Rasmussus, what does it mean? He said, Dad, I'm not an expert in occasion, but I have a friend who is. I'll talk to him and I'll call you back. I told him where I got it. And he called me back and said, you, Do you remember now, Dad, when I took you through the, uh, through the natural uh, museum, the British Museum of Natural History? I said, Yeah. And we went through the Assyrian section. I said, Oh, yeah, I remember that creepiest thing. I, man, I remember going through that section. He said, you remember those funny-looking little animals that had funny-looking faces and wings? And I said, you mean like the Gorgals on the Masonic Temple? He said, yes, that's them. That's them. Those are the Rasmussens. 
They are winged spiritual beings that can be malevolent or accepted to you. Depending on whether or not you have made an adequate sacrifice to the God that controls us. In other words, they're a demon. I said, oh. And so what it says is that a demon crouches at the door to rule over you. Name sin. Okay, let's have now let's have slide Romans five eight. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sin. There he's speaking of Adam. Sin entered the world through Adam because Adam sinned. Next. Therefore, do not let sin, that's Romans six twelve, reign or rule in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. So you have sin in the flesh of your body. Now, is it a demon? Uh, Norman Parrish said, no, it's a demon. You can cast it out. You can't cast that out. Before you were saved, you were enslaved to it, and you had to obey it. The law of sin and death. Now, life in the Spirit, it says in Romans 8, 1, 8, 2, life in the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. That is sin. But don't let that sin reign. You can say no to it. But it can bring up thoughts in your mind. I mean, you're riding down the road, and this bad thought comes up in your mind. It can be lusting after a Cadillac, or a mink coat, or your neighbor's wife, or neighbor's husband, any sort of thing. And you say, where did that come from? I reject that in the name of Jesus. And you push it down. Okay, next slide. But now if... I do what I will not to do. No longer I do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, some people will tell you this is Paul's talking about before he was saved. But you notice we're following sin all the way through. And I think it's talking about when you yield to sin, you become its slave. Jesus said in Romans John and John 8, when you, rule, when you yield to sin, you become slain slave. Next slide. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you don't have to obey it. You can say no. Next slide. Or it can be flesh or soulish desires. Flesh. You know, your soul wants to be the leader. And your soul has three parts. It wants to rule your body. It doesn't want to let the Spirit rule it. It wants to rule it. And so here, and it's commonly called the flesh or soulish desires. And let's look at Romans 8. Because the carnal mind or the fleshy mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Next slide. Now this is an interesting one here. James 1.14 says, Let no one say he's tempted of God, for God cannot tempt with evil. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust, or desires, and enticed. That word, their desires, or lust, means bait. When these thoughts come into your mind, the devil will throw this thought out. Your soul will throw out this thought, this bait, trying to hook you so it can take over. Enticed, it comes from a Greek, it comes from the French, means to be inflamed, to be set on fire. I mean, you know, <gasps> oh, look at that. Man, that is a beautiful car. Man, I want that one. Mm-hmm. I just got to have that one. Man, look at that, boy. Boy, that'll make me. Oh, that'll show everybody how God has blessed me. I've got to get that one. Let me get down there and I can buy this at, a, at such and such a discount and I can make payments, you know, for the next 15 years. <laughs> and you drive it around the block and it breaks down. Praise God. Next. <laughs> And the last source of your thoughts is demonic being. Now, where does it say devil can put thoughts in your mind? Look at John 13, 2. He said, In the supper being ended, the devil, having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to portray him. That word heart means your innermost being, your soul. And so the devil can put these thoughts in. And so every time you get a thought, comes into your mind. You say, where did that come from? Did I decide? No. Is that the Holy Spirit? No. Well, it's either, it's either out of my flesh, it's out of sin that dwells in my body, or flesh or soulish desires, those things I have authority over and I'm not going to do them, and I just push them down and say, no. If it is a demon, 
projecting that thought into my mind. A familiar spirit that's sitting out there, right there, just projecting that thought. Now remember, demons don't... Did you know that uh, if you hear a spirit voice, it will not record on a tape recorder? You hear spirit sounds in your house, groaning, chains rattling, and so forth. It will not record on a tape recorder. Now you call the Paris parapsychology department of Duke University that studies spirits and say, how do I tell whether these are spirits? I have to get a tape recorder. They record on a tape recorder. It's not a spirit because those sounds are dependent upon compression of airways. And spirits don't have vocal cords unless they're using yours. They're projecting those by thought transmission. And so it's projected. And so you say, what do you do with them? You bind him in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you. I had an interesting experience. I related it in my book. You know, it's very dangerous to get out and tell folks that you see things that other folks don't see and you hear voices other folks don't hear. They label you psychotic. I wrote it in a book back there and published it. I woke up one morning and I had a heavy weight sitting on my chest. It felt like 25 pounds of flour sitting on my chest. I opened my mouth and there was this big cobra sitting on my chest. And I looked at him, you know, and he looked at me and he was all hooded out and his beady little eyes and he was whooping back and forth. And I said, uh, being God's man of faith and power, you know, I pulled the cover up over my head. <laughs> and this sweet little boy said to me, just as patiently, you can bind him. So I pulled the cover back down just enough to see him. He was still there. So I bind you in the name of Jesus. And a hand came out of nowhere and put this shackle on him. And another one on this side, three of them all told him they tightened them chains up and they hauled that booger out through my bedroom door. I said, well, look at that. And then I looked in this huge black wood spider. He had a belly on him as big as a zinc wash tub. Big eyeglass and big long black legs. He's looking at me and I said, I bind you too. And then, <laughs> it didn't take me long though. No, I didn't have to be told to do that one. And out came the shackles, and they, they bound that booger up, and they hauled him off. And I said, now, Lord, what does that mean? What does that mean, Lord? And I didn't get an answer. And I got up, got dressed. I was getting ready to come to any camp meeting. And so I got to camp meeting, and I talked to Mildred. and <sighs> Mildred Coffey and her husband. And they uh, we decided we would fast and pray. And so that afternoon, her husband came up. We went to men's deliverance meeting. said, Doc, God has shown me that you've been blessed. Really? He said, he's allowed you to see what happens in the spirit world when you bind something. Because that word bind means to tie it with chains. And he immediately witnessed to me Psalm 149 that says, uh, With the high praises of God in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand, you shall bind their kings and nobles with fetters of iron. This privilege has all the saints. So thank you, Lord God, I see that now. And I said, but why is it, Lord, when I'm walking, I'm walking down and I'm being harassed by one of these devils, and I just bind him and I just bind him, and he just keeps right on, and I keep on binding, and he keeps on. And so he gave me a vision, open vision. And there I was walking down the street, and there was a line of demons walking beside me that went, I mean, went over the hill. You couldn't see them. And every time I bound one of the angels, would haul him away, and another one step right up and keep right on talking like nothing had happened. And God made me understand that after he had, after the devil, you know, the devil's only got a finite number of devils. He doesn't have an unlimited number of demons. He's got a definite number. And after he lost a hundred of his troops, say, you know, he said, you know, this ain't working too good. We try something else. And so we're like with Jesus. You know, it said in Luke that the devil departed to wait a more opportune time. And so he'll go away and he'll run his mouse around on the computer screen and say, oh, this worked against his granddaddy. Let's try this one. And so he hits you from a different... He don't ever quit. Now, don't ever think. I remember this man, he made a, de he made a pact with the devil. He was a preacher. The preacher, well, he was harassing him and so forth. And, and he told the devil, he said, you know, he made a pact with the devil that he'd quit preaching deliverance if the devil would quit attacking his family. Can you imagine that? Now, the devil will expect you to keep your end of the bar, but he ain't got no... He, he got... There's no way he's going to keep his. And you can't make a deal with the devil. You're dealing with a liar and a thief and a cheat and a murderer. And that's all he does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay. Let's look at the next one now. Binding. Oh, Jesus. Well, let's look at Matthew 29. 
How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first bounds a strong man, then he will plunder his house? So you have to bind the strong man, okay? And in Luke, we've read that, that the mom fully guards his place, his guards in peace. But when a strong man, he comes and overtakes and takes away all of his armor. Now, what's his armor? That's all the curses. That's all the unforgiveness. All the curses. All the involvement in the occult and sexual sin and all the sin in your life. All these curses from that. And you, you confess your sin and break those curses. Then the Holy Spirit takes them away. And the devil has no legal right to stay. That's the armor that protects him. Then you can bind him and pull him out of that stronghold. See, he's down in a hole. And he's got all that armor piled up over him. All those curses. Until you get rid of them curses, you don't get him. He's hit out back down there. And so you got to break the curses that give him a legal right to be there. The legal grounds. you got to withdraw the legal grounds. Okay, next slide. And they overcame him by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, a lot of folks, they'll, they'll plead the blood of the Lamb, and they'll talk their testimony, but they love their lives, boy. They, they, want to, they don't want to give it up to Jesus. You gotta give it up. Say, God, wherever, whatever you want. I'll go where you go. I'll say, well, I'll do what you say, and I won't look back. So, those are dangerous words because he'll take you up on it, but he'll honor them. Next. Now, this applies to you in the area of your authority. Now, look at this, this, look at this. Matthew 6, 16. Now, we hear this talked a lot. I got this in the New King James. I wish I had it done in the Old King James. And he's talking to Peter. Now, I'll quote it to you out of the Old King James. I also say to thee that thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, he's talking about the revelation that he is the Son of God. And I will give to thee, to Peter, the keys, the kingdom of God, of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the end of part A of this CD. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2006 Labor Day Teaching and Deliverance Camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is Friday afternoon, September the 1st, 2006. Dr. William Knoll is the speaker of this service teaching on Called to War. This is now the conclusion of this message from part A. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, he's given that to an individual, and that is given, that right to bind is given to an individual in the area of his authority where God has called you. You know, you are the ambassador to the Iran. You ain't got no business over in Iraq or down in South America someplace, trying to claim your authority as the ambassador. You're supposed to stay where God sent you, in the area. Now, what is that area? That's your personal life, your family, your children, your grandchildren. You can extend it out over to and, and claim your brothers and your sisters and their children. Okay, If you happen to be a pastor, your flock. If you happen to be an employer, your employees. I can show you all, all this in Scripture, but I don't have two hours. Another two hours, I've run out of time now. It's already, I've been talking two hours, almost an hour and a half. And I need to, to wind up. But let's look at the next slide. Now, Matthew 18:15 is applies to the church of the body of believers. Now, we're going to read a little bit before it so you get the context. More if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. But if he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two witnesses, for by the mouths of three witnesses let every word be established. That's the Old Testament. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear even the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax Surely I say to you, 
Whatever you bind on earth, and that is you is plural, ye. Whatever ye bind on earth, I say to ye, whatever ye bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Next slide. And again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered or called together in my name, I am there in the midst. Now you see, that two of you agree, that word agree is symphonized. It means spiritual harmony. It's not a mental agreement. You know, the brother calls up and says, Hey, I want you to agree with me that I can have enough money to make a down payment. Oh, I agree with you, brother. Yep, you got the money. That is not what he's talking about. And some of the other gross misapplications I've seen on religious television. It means that when you come together, or called together by the Holy Spirit, and you come into spiritual harmony, and that's the reason in this morning I said it's so important for you to stay with me. It's not a spectator sport to stay in the Spirit, stay with me and pray for each individual. There's enough spiritual power in this place to move things. You need to stay in the Spirit. And for He's there in the midst of you and He'll do whatever you ask Him to if you ask it in the Spirit with Him. It says, that you know, I told you in First John, it says, when you pray according to the will of God, you know He hears you and you know that you'll... And if He hears you, you'll have what you ask for. Okay. That's the last slide. Binding means to tie up with chains. What does loosening mean? Loose means to untie or to destroy. You know, in First John it said, For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the devil. That's loosed. Loose you. Now, as I understand it, that means that when you break this curse here and bind that demon and break that curse, the records... In the second heaven, where the enemy has recorded all your sins and all his legal grounds to harass you or destroy it. That's what it means. And you are binding them, those, those, those entities, those principalities in the, in the second heavens up there that are directing this warfare against you. You are binding them so they can't act against you on these grounds. And you are loosening yourself from them. You are destroying those records, those legal rights. And they can't touch you in that area again. That's what it means. That's the way I understand it. You bind the demon, and they are hauled off to the pit. I don't believe they come back. I believe that once you bind them, they're bound. I don't believe God turns them loose, let them come back and harass you again. That verse in Matthew 12, there is nothing in that verse to make you believe. It says, when a spirit departs and walks through dry places, and finding no rest, says, I will return to my house. There's no indication that verse that that spirit was bound by a believer. Now, Jesus had bound the spirits 12 verses prior. Now, in Luke, different. it does follow the spirit of taking away their armor, and by the finger of God, casting out spirits. But there are some other... Uses in the Greek that I can I don't want to go into now, but I just believe I don't believe that the spirits come back. Some people say they do. I'm not going to argue with them. God has not spoken to me Himself and said, and Scripture is not you you interpret it. And some people will take the same verse and give you a different interpretation. But the main thing is that if you don't open yourself, He can't come back and torment you. Once you take out His armor and you bind Him and you cast Him out. If you don't open yourself, now he can come sit on your bed and say, I'm coming in, back in. You say, oh, no, you not. I'm free of you. He can't come in. But he's a liar and he'll try to bluff his way in, in the name of Jesus. I have him, before we start praying, this is a 30-page thing on the gap theory and on the conflict, talking about Satan and so forth. It cost me a dollar a quarter. It costs four cents a page to be duplicated. If anybody wants one, you can you can fill out its verses and you can fill them out and write them down. There's spaces for you to fill them out and write them down. You know, it's said that you will, uh, and it has all the verses that Ho, Tohu, and Bohu, and a number of other stuff. It's a lesson I wrote years ago that I never published. Uh I guess maybe someday I might get around to it. God just wouldn't let me do it. 
But uh, if you want one, give her a dollar and she'll give you one. It cost me a dollar and a quarter. But if you give, if you put a dollar in it, you will probably do something with it. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, they'll take it, but they'll take it home and they'll put it on the shelf and they won't ever do anything. But if you invest money in it, most of the time it means you're going to do something with it. Personally, I'd give it to you myself. I don't care. But there, I think there are 30 of them back then. Everybody stand up now and, you know, and get your blood circulating. Let's praise God a little bit. And now we can, then we're going to pray. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise and bless and glorify you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you and we glorify It's been a long day. I'm sorry I took so long. I hope you will forgive me. Praise you and bless you and glorify you. Everybody jump up and down and get your blood moving now, folks, in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you and we bless you and we glorify you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your kindness to us, Lord. Oh, God, pour your Spirit out. Pour out your Spirit, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now, people, how many, if you, for those who've never been in a mass deliverance service, let me tell you that the word for spirit in both the Hebrew and the Greek means air or breath. Spirits a breath for air. And they come out of the breathing passages. And you just and it says that believers shall expel or cast out or expel demons. And what that means is that you will spell or expel them out. You take a deep breath and push them out. You got a chest full of smoke and you want to get rid of it, you it's a contraction of the muscles and a blowing out. And that's the way you expel demons. Sometimes they come out as a cough, a yawn. Sometimes they'll come out as a, as a. Uh, sometimes you'll vomit. Now I'm not, in, I'm not encouraging manifestations, but I say this: if one comes, don't choke it down. You're holding your demon in. Just let it go. You're worried about your dignity. Don't worry about your dignity. You get your dignity back. If you got to choose between your dignity and your demons, let the demons go. You can get your dignity back. Nobody else worried about you. They're worried about their own demons. They're not watching you. They want. They just want to get rid of that. In the name of Jesus. I tell you, when I first came here and they called out my demons, I said, here three days, nothing happened, you know, and I got up and complained. I, and he said, well, maybe today will be your day. And so he got up, he had me, he said, I got a list of demons here. God gave me a call out. my list. <laughs> he called out that first one, he threw me out of that chair in that second row right there, and I f- fell out and I vomited on the floor. And I tried to get up and he called out the next one, I rolled in my vomitus and vomited again. And then this young man came over and stood about three feet away and prayed for me. And I was covered up with vomitus all over. But I'm going to tell you something, I got free. I was so happy. I was just, I just jumping and shouting, covered with vomitus. Went out and took a shower and put on fresh clothes and never thought anything about it. I was just glad to get free. Praise your Lord. So, I don't encourage manifestations. We don't encourage manifestations. Some folks say you don't get delivered unless you have a manifestation. That's not, I, don't, I have not found that to be true. But if one comes, let it go. Don't pray in tongues. There'll be time to pray in tongues after deliverance. But if you're praying in tongues, they will not come out over tongues. If you're praying and praising God and thanking God, sitting there and praying, the demons ain't going to come out over that. What you do is you listen to what the the prayers say and agree with them and push it out. Take a deep breath and let it go. Breathe it out in the name of Jesus. And let what happens happen in the name of Jesus. Let them go. Now, the first thing we do, we're going to... Have an affirmation of the gospel. Say, Dear Lord, Dear Lord I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on the cross for my sin. He was manifested in the flesh. He lived a perfect sinless life. He was crucified on the cross for me. Shed His blood for me. Raised from the dead on the third day. Ascended into heaven. Sits on the right hand of God the Father. Ever to make intercession for me. God is my Father. Jesus Christ is my big brother. I am a member of the family of God. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. All my sins are forgiven, and I have been made accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. I rebuke the devil. I repent of all the sins of my ancestors. And my sin. I forgive anyone that's ever hurt me, abused me, or used me. I ask you to bless them, Lord. I forgive myself, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. I break any curses spoken by me or any other source in the name of Jesus. For Jesus was made a curse for me that I might be delivered from the curse of the law. Lord Jesus, I confess all my sexual sin. I confess the sin of the occult. Any sin of the cult that's come through my family line, or my sin, such as looking at horoscopes, playing with the Ouija board, going to the fortune teller, going to the card layer, the tea leaf reader, all ESP, all clairvoyance. All precognition, all second sight, I rebuke them, I bind them, I break the curse of them, and I declare myself free, and my children forever, in the name of Jesus. I bind all these things, and I cast them out, and I command them to leave me now. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody take a deep breath. Let them go. Let them go. Just let them go in the name of Jesus. Come on out. Out in the name of Jesus. Let them go. Everybody have a seat now. I want everybody to keep both feet on the floor. Remember when you were a little child, you said if you crossed your fingers, you didn't have to tell the truth. Remember that? Well, the devil looked at you, got your feet crossed, and he said, well, she don't mean that. She, she got her feet crossed. But he's a legalist. I mean, he'll look at any legal, any kind of trick to stay. He's a, like a crooked lawyer, man. He'll do anything to stay there. He wants to stay. Now, in the name of Jesus, I break the curse of rejection. In the name of Jesus. I bind rejection by father, rejection by mother, rejection by friends, rejection by spiritual authority, by pastors. In the name of Jesus, by a husband, by children, I break all the re- spirits of rejection in the name of Jesus. Rejection, I bind you. I speak to fear now. I speak to all the Hittite spirits. All the Hittite spirits of fear, I bind you. Oh, come on out. Fear of rejection now. Fear of not being good enough. Come on out. I bind that spirit of rejection, spirit of fear of rejection, fear of not being good enough. Come out. Fear. Fear. I bind all fear. God didn't give them a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I break the spirit. I speak to grasshopper spirits. Grasshopper spirits. Come out. Self-rejection. Come out. Come out. Fear. Fear. Going back into bondage from fear. Rejection. Self-rejection. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't like who I am. I bind you and I break your power and I command you to go in the mighty name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power. Come on out in the name of Jesus. All idolatry now. Idolatry. Come out. Love of the world. Lust of the eye. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Come out. Come out. Come out. Love of the world. Come out. All the adultery spirits. Adulterers and adulteresses. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. You turn God's people loose. You have no right to God's people. I bind you and I break your power in the name of Jesus. I speak healing and restoration in Jesus' name. I bind the spirits of idolatry now. Come out. Come out. Idolatry. Vain imaginations. Come out. Come out. Daydreaming. Vain imaginations. Come out. In the name of Jesus. All vain imaginations. Come out. Come out. Come out. In the name of Jesus, all daydreaming, all idolatry. In the name of Jesus, I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. Come out. I bind the spirit of perverseness, perverse spirits. Come out. 
argumentation, debate, rebellion, come out. All perverse spirits, perverse sexual spirits, I bind you and I break your power. All spirits of homosexuality and lesbianism, come out. All spirits of all oral genital sex, all dysfunctional sex spirits, I bind you. All impotent spirits, come out. All ED spirits, come out in the name of Jesus. All nisiracious spirits, come out. I bind you and I break your power. I command you to go. Anaresis spirits, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. All dysfunctional spirits, out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind the spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. I break their power in Jesus' mighty name. All spirits of depression, come out. Come out. Anxiety in the heart breeds heaviness. Come out. Heavy spirits, spirits of heaviness, depression, come out. All spirits of depression, come out. Chemical imbalances, come out. All the curses spoken over them from physicians for chemical imbalances. Come out. All chemical imbalances. Come out, chemical imbalances. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out. Come out. Come out. We bind you and we break your power in the name of Jesus. Patty, Patty. In the name of Jesus Christ, we break your power. Let her go. Let them go. All you depression spirits. All you spirits of depression, heaviness. Come out. Come out, all you spirits of mind control. Come out, all you spirits of, in the name of Jesus. Come out, come out, all you spirits of mind control. Come out, all you spirits of loss of memory. Come out, of inattentiveness. Come out, of lassitude. Come out, of sleepiness. Come out, in the name of Jesus Christ. All you spirits of agitation. Come out, all you depression spirits. Uh, come out, death, suicide spirits, death spirits. I bind suicide and death. I break the power of suicide. Come out, suicide. Death spirits. Death wishes. Come out, death spirits. I bind you and I break your power in the name of Jesus Christ. You let God's people go. Go in the name of Jesus. All spirits of perfectionism. Come out. Spirits of perfectionism. Come out. Everything in its place and a place for everything. Come out, perfectionism. I bind perfectionism in the name of Jesus. Get it right. I'm going to check it right. I'm going to check their work. I'm going to make sure they're right. Then I'm going to make a mistake in the name of Jesus. I'm going to correct them. I'm going to give them co spiritual correction. I'm going to give them corrective, co constructive criticism in the name of Jesus. All spirits of constructive criticism. Come out. Come out. All nitpicking spirits. Come out. Come out. Come out. All nitpicking spirits, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you and I break your power in the name of Jesus. You come out of God's people. We bind you and we break your power and encourage you to go. Go. Go in the name of Jesus. All spirits of pride being lifted up, anger and stubbornness. All spirits of pride. Pride spirits, come out. All spirits of rebellion. Rebellious spirits, come out. All Antichrist spirits, all Jezebel spirits, all Antichrist spirits, all rebellious spirits, come out. Stiff-necked spirits, spirits of stiff-neckedness, of stubbornness, stubborn spirits, come out. Come out. Come out. I'm not going to work. I'm going to do it my way. Come out. All that I'm going to do it my way spirits. My way, highway, either my way or the highway. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Let them go. All the spirits, I'm right, he's wrong. All spirits, are incorrectable spirits, in the name of Jesus. Come out, all spirits of uncorrectionness, all stubborn spirits, all legalism, iron legalism. Come out, iron legalism, I break your power. Jezebel, I speak to you. Turn them loose in the name of Jesus Christ. All you Jezebel spirits, come out of those, come out of the men, in the name of Jesus. I'm right, I'm right, I'm always right. Why can't they see it? Why can't they see I'm right? Come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Go. 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 I'm going to take a deep breath and let Jezebel go in the name of Jesus. Let Jezebel go. Celebi. Come out in the name of Jesus. Celebi. Diana. Come out. Diana. Celebi. Astra. Come out. Come out. Tucka. Tika. Come out. Come out. Orzenus. Come out. Iris. Come out. Celebi, come out. Similars, come out. I bind all of you. I break your power in the name of Jesus. I break the curse of abortion in the name of Jesus Christ. I break the curse of abortion that came down through the family line. 
I break the curse of abortion. Come out. Turn them loose now. Turn them loose. Turn them loose. I break the curse of the bastard that came down through the family line. They won't let them associate with people. It keeps them separated. Come out. Come out. Won't let them enter into the congregation. Makes them fearful. Fearful. Come out. Come out. I break your power in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirits of yoga in the name of Jesus. Yoga. Bind the spirits of martial arts. Come out. Yoga. Martial arts. Transmendental meditation. I speak to Kali. I speak to Zenai. I speak to Verdi. I bind you in Jesus' name. Turn loose. Come out. Take I. Come out. All you martial arts spirits in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I break your power. All yoga spirits. I come against the spirits of yoga, but not Lamas. I come against Lamas now. The yoga spirits of Lamas. Come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power in the name of Jesus. Go. Go. All hala yoga. Hala yoga. Come out. Kanilima. Kanilima. Silva. I bind you and I break your power, Silva. Savana. I speak into you, Savana. I bind you and I break your power. You turn God's people loose. Come out, Savannah. Everybody take a deep breath and let Savannah go. Let her go. Come on out of there in the name of Jesus. Savannah, come out. Kanilima, bind you. I break your power. You can't torment God's people anymore. Turn her loose. Come on out of there in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power. And I loose the hornets from heaven to come after you. I break the power of idolatry now in the name of Jesus. I break the power of whoredom. I break the curse of whoredom over them in the name of Jesus Christ. Whoredom, wine, and new wine. Take away the soul. Enslave the soul. Turn it loose. I speak healing to them now. I break the curse of learning disabilities, of dyslexia, of learning disabilities in the name of Jesus Christ, of memory loss. I bind it and I break its power and I speak restoration to the soul. Come out, bondage to drugs. Come out, wine bibbing spirits, gluttony spirits, bondage to gluttony, bondage to wine, bondage to drugs. Come out, marijuana spirits, cocaine spirits, sleeping pill spirits. Come out, come out. All you isometric spirits, in the name of Jesus Christ, all you mind-binding spirits, psychometric spirits, we bind you and we break your power. Turn God's people loose. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bind you and we break your power. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody take a deep breath now. Let them go. Come on out. Let them go. Turn them loose. Don't you bind them. Don't you touch them. I bind and I break the power of the death and dumb spirits in the name of Jesus. Now I come against the infirmity spirits. I bind and break. I pull out the root of bitterness. I pull out the root of bitterness. I pull out the knife of betrayal. And I pull out the bitterness. And I say, be gone, bitterness. Be gone, you defiling spirit. And I come against the spirits of diabetes now in the name of Jesus. And arthritis. Turn them loose. Come out, diabetes. Come out, gluttony, diabetes, arthritis. Come out. Come out, arthritis. Turn them loose. Turn your hips loose. Turn your backs loose. Come out. Come out. All you serpentine devils, be gone. I bind you and I break your power and command you to go. All spirits of repressed anger and rage, come out. All that anger and rage, come out. Come out in the name of Jesus. Anger, rage, come out in the name of Jesus. Unforgiveness, come out. I break its power in the name of Jesus. And I praise you and bless you and glorify you. Lord, I just ask for a spirit of miracles. Everybody hold up their hands now. Lord, just let your spirit come down. Lord, I ask for a spirit of miracles now, Lord God, just to touch your people. It flow into them, Lord. Let your spirit flow into them now, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Just, just wait a minute now. Don't be in a hurry. Let your spirit flow, river, flow, river. Oh, God, let your spirit flow down upon your people. More of your spirit, Lord God. Hallelujah. Let them hear the angels sing, Lord God. Touch them now, Lord God, with your healing grace. 
For it's not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God of hosts. And Zerubbabel shall say to this mountain, Grace, grace, and shall become a flat plain. So I say, Grace, grace to this mountain now in the name of Jesus. Grace, and let it become a flat plain, Lord God. Touch them, Lord. You know what the mountains are. And I speak to that tree now, and I say, Ye be plucked up and planted in the ocean. I speak it into existence. And I speak to those spirits, and I say, be gone now. And those diseases, I say, be healed. I say, be healed in the name of Jesus. The healing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let your healing grace flow, Lord. Flow, rubber. Oh, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord God. Oh, God. Praise your name. You can all stand up now. Praise you, Lord God. Just stand up, hold your hands up, and just stand up now and praise God. Let your grace flow down, Lord. Flow, River. Flow, River. Hallelujah. Just touch the hearts, Lord God. Just touch the hearts, Lord. Lord, I just bind fear. It says, in the latter days, men's hearts shall fail from fear. I bind fear. And I speak health and wholeness to hearts now. Oh, God, touch your people, Lord God. I speak healing to their mind, restorations, Lord God. But well, this is the year of restoration. Restoration, Lord, restoration. Thank you, Lord God. And all God's folks said, Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and LHBC online. Com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.